Good afternoon from Stanford, California, and good evening and good afternoon depends on where you are. Welcome to the third Epic China Education Forum at Stanford University. This is panel two on K-12 school reform and innovation. My name is Melody Wu. I am the co-moderator of today's presentation and discussion. And I am a current master's student at the Stanford Graduate School of Education. It is a great pleasure to have our guest speaker here today and thank you all for joining us. Hello everyone, my name is Cassie Zhang, another co-moderator for today's event. I'm a currently master's student in International Comparative Education Program under Stanford Graduate School of Education. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, and our schedule for today's panel is fairly straightforward. We will begin with the opening presentation given by Dr. Pope. Then we will process the panel discussion in which our speaker will answer questions and engage in conversations. Towards the end of the panel, we will open up 20 minutes Q&A section in which our audience is invited to pose questions to our speakers. Within this in mind, please ask your questions using the Q&A function found on the bottom of your screen. Maddy and I will monitor those questions and post them to speakers during Q&A section. Now I'm going to introduce our guest speaker today. Dr. Dennis Pope is a senior lecturer at the Stanford University Graduate School of Education. She specializes in student engagement, curriculum studies, quality research methods, and service learning. Dr. Pope also founded Challenge, a nonprofit organization helping students to implement research-based strategies for student well-being and engagement. She's also the author of award-winning book, Doing School, How We Are Creating a Generation of Stressed Out, Materialistic, and Miseducated Students, and the co-author of Overloaded and Underprepared Strategy for Strong Schools and Healthy Successful Kids. I read Dr. Pope's books and I enjoy them a lot. And very luckily, those two books are being translated into Chinese. So feel free to check them out. Now I'm going to introduce one of our panelists, Mr. Dave Delgado. Mr. Delgado has nearly 30 years of private school management experience. Experience including various levels of administration, school development and organization, quality assurance, curriculum development, teacher selection and training, student assessment, student counseling, teaching, and problem solving. In addition, he has extensive experience working with international students from countries including China, Vietnam, Russia, India, Germany, France, Brazil, and others. He is specializing emphasizing on helping Asian students adjust to U.S. culture before studying college. Thank you, Kathy, for the introduction. Oh. Um, our next panelist is Mr. Austin Voss. Mr. Voss is the Director of Program Design at Avenue Research and Development. He has an international background as an educator and researcher that include Fulbright in Germany and visiting scholar at Fudan University in Shanghai, China. His current work includes a broad range of projects, including the lead author of the Element of Education for Teachers, running the World Languages Program for Avenue Online, developing a unique high school center on innovation and making, and developing a gap year program focused on developing long-term thinking. Last but not the least, we have Ms. Cindy Liu to join us. Ms. Cindy is a director of strategy and operations at Yumin Charter School. Cindy has worked at, as a strategy consultant in leading consulting firms such as Bain & Co, Iralda Education Partners, and some high-performing international schools. She has also worked extensively with children from underserved community uh, for a, a, about 15 years to improve their education access and to provide social emotional support. In the recent year, she participated in innovative school model design as, as well as new school launches and operation in the Bay Area. So um, let's get it started. Uh, as Cassie introduced, Dr. Paul has over 30 years of experience helping schools and parents to improve student well-being. Cassie and I took, um, and also Yuma in the back helping us, uh, took Dr. Paul's class last quarter, and we could not thank Dr. Paul more for her teaching. Um, from curriculum ideology to school uh, courses designed to school politics and reform, it was my first teaching and learning class, and I enjoyed it a lot. One more thing that I want, uh, I got really inspired by Dr. Paul was her emphasis on giving back to our community. So her class was actually a cardinal course at Stanford, 
which is devoted to help uh, projects and partnership in the community that address social and environmental changes. Dr. Paul, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, it's your time, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. I was actually supposed to be presenting at a conference in Boston and I wasn't gonna be able to make this. So a little silver lining to COVID-19 is that I could be here uh, doing this virtually. So that's great. And um, uh, it was a pleasure to have all of you as my students in, 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 the, in my class last quarter. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. What I wanna talk about today, let's see. Yes, we're gonna do this. I'm going to go to this. All right. Um, let's go from the slides. We, uh, some of you might have seen this before, but at Challenge Success, we've done a bunch of research around best practices for schools. And this is best practices for schools, not during a pandemic necessarily, but we find that the best practices aren't that different as we switch over to thinking about best practices for remote learning as well. Um, one of the most important things before I even get into the space framework is uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I want, you know, because I'm a professor, I have to bring in some, some of that research. And basically what that says, and I think many of you know this, is that no learning is gonna take place until you've met some basic foundational needs. At the bottom of that hierarchy of that pyramid is, uh, are, are things like health, shelter, right? Um, food, you, you, you have to make sure that your students have the basics. And I think what we've seen here in the United States is that we depend on schools for lots and lots of different kinds of services. One of which, which is really important right now, is as a food provider and also as a, as a safe haven, particularly for homeless kids, uh, for kids when uh, they're worried about gangs and whatnot, the school can provide that kind of basic at the bottom of the hierarchy. Right up from that is relationships. And I think we know too, as educators, that, 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 that again, no learning, no, no meaningful learning is gonna take place unless you have that kind of relationship with the student, unless the students feel that they um, have an adult who they can trust, they feel safe at the school where they belong, um, and they feel that, that people are looking out for them. And I think one of the things that we've seen in the United States during the pandemic is that's probably the most important thing to start out is once you make sure that everybody's healthy and has the food, then you go to, okay, are you safe? Do you feel like you belong? We, we care about you. We, as your teacher, we're checking in. We're not just coming, popping on the screen and saying, open to page five of your math book, but we're checking in with you. And that very much falls into one of these categories. So let me just walk you through the space framework. And this is, um, this is in the book that, that um, Cassie mentioned. Um, it's also on the Challenge Success website, and I'll, I'll give that to you at the end. Um, but the S stands for the schedule and use of time. And it turns out um, both not during a pandemic and during a pandemic, the schedule is really important. How much time are kids spending in class? How much time are they spending on the screen um, or in person in class? What does that schedule look like? Um, it's very traditional to have very short periods, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and lots of transitions. And maybe kids are going to eight or nine a day. And what we try to do is get people to think through that that's not really how learning happens in a, in a good way. We need to see um, periods of time where kids can get together with uh, their full class, but then there's times where maybe they're going offline or into small groups. There's times where they're working alone. And what is the optimum schedule during a time like this? Obviously, we don't want kids online all day. Um, there is such a thing as Zoom fatigue, looking at, at, at screens. and the kind of work you have to do to understand what's going on on the screen um, and listening and looking at, at, at faces. Um, so we're recommending a schedule with ample breaks with time where kids can actually see their friends and see their, their teachers, but also time offline to get some of that work done. And because we're in the middle of a pandemic, we're asking all schools to really think through the load of work, less is more. Um, you know, can, do you need to uh, have final exams as an example? Do you need to have as many tests and quizzes? How do you even give a test online? And I'll hit that in a second. Um, and, and homework. So any, 
you know, this is the same, these are the same slides that I would give even if we weren't in a pandemic. You have to think through what is best for kids, how much can they process, and how do we space that out in a way that makes sense and is healthy for everybody. The P stands for project and problem-based learning. And again, we know from research that this is a much better way to learn. This is very different from sort of traditional classrooms where there's frontal lecture for the full period, kids are memorizing, taking notes, and then um, showing what they know on an exam. We are looking for the kind of learning that happens in the real world, much more relevant, rigorous. I know for sure about avenues that this is going on there. I'm sorry, I don't know Dave uh, as much about your school, but um, it turns out that this is more engaging. It also turns out that this is preparing kids for the actual um, challenges that they're gonna meet in the real world. That in the real world, and this is, this is part of the A, in the real world, you don't really have tests. You don't have a paper and pencil test that is timed that um, someone says you can't use any of the resources around you. You, you can't use your, your computer. You can't ask a friend. You can't ask a buddy. You can't ask the teacher. Um, there is a time and a place for those kinds of exams, but it's very, very rare that in the real world, that's how you assess someone's mastery. That's how you assess their knowledge. Um, so we talk about ways that you can authentically assess um, how do you know when someone's done a good job, particularly in project-based learning, it lends itself beautifully to that, right? The, the project succeeds, uh, the, the, um, the paper gets written, the, the, um, the, the authentic audience weighs in and gives you feedback. And that's really what we're after here at Challenge Success and with the schools that we work with and really thinking through ways that kids can revise and redeem themselves. Nobody does their best work on a first try. You need to get that feedback. You need to have that ability to redo. As Cassie and Melody and Yuman know, uh, in my class, you can revise your paper. So even at the graduate school level, um, I pass something back, I give lots of feedback, and they can revise it and turn it in for a full replacement of their grade because they've showed me that they have mastered the skills that I wanted them to master. Um, the other thing that we talk about, particularly during the pandemic, but also not during the pandemic, are what are your grading policies? How are you um, using grades? Uh, are you using them as punishment? Are you using them as motivation, as carrots? We really want the grades to be an accurate reflection of what someone knows um, and giving them every ability that they can to raise that grade to sort of show what they know and show that they've mastered it. And then you use that grade as a signal to outside people outside the school to say, yes, they've met these criteria. That's very different from how grading is used sort of normally in many schools. And um, right now during the pandemic, Challenge Success has partnered with a, a few other uh, groups to come up with grading guidelines. And you can see those on our website. But we're asking because we're in such an unusual situation and kids at no fault of their own may not be able to perform, whether they're anxious, whether they've got grandma in the hospital, whether they've got, um, you know, uh, uh, in, unstable internet, whatever it might be. So we're actually recommending that schools um, do not grade on a transcript. You can still use grades during the time of remote learning, but don't put a final grade on that transcript. Put a pass or incomplete. And if it's incomplete, to allow kids to make up that work. And, and I can tell you just um, personally, I had a student who came from Wuhan who was in my co graduate course, and absolutely that student needed some extra time and some understanding and needed the ability to uh, take the class pass incomplete um, because there was no way that that student could focus on the learning at the graduate level with all that, that, that they had going on. The C is probably the most important um, category, and that is a climate of care. That's how we started out this whole talk, which is really focusing on belonging, on making sure that the child feels safe, that they feel like you have your, their back, that it's not out of fear that they're learning. It's out of um, a relationship between themselves and the teacher, between themselves and their peers. And that's really um, in need of a genuine focus on social and emotional learning. And we ask all of our schools to think about how they're absolutely teaching the skills of social and emotional learning. Do they have an advisory period where kids can get to know each other, where there's an adult who has their back, who's really looking out especially for them? Maybe that group stays together over um, a few years or over all the years where they have almost like a little family at the school. 
Um, and of course, right now, all of us are modeling coping strategies. Right now, the kids are learning a lot, you know, particularly um, from parents where they're learning at their houses how to deal with a difficult situation, how to deal with fear, how to handle strong emotions. And they're really learning resilience. Um, so all these parents who are worried that, you know, are my kids behind? Are they gonna fall behind? Are they not getting enough? We're not covering everything we're supposed to cover in Algebra 1. Can my kid go on to Algebra 2? My message to them is learning happens all over the place. And you're, they're actually getting a, quite a bit of learning happening right now in a pandemic. It might not be particularly on the academic subject level, but they're learning all these important things about how you cope, how you handle fear, um, uh, wh which adults you know, have your back, um, what is most important when it comes to thinking about your community and, and, and the world. Um, so that's the C. And then the last one is the E. And, and really, um, this is what you know, we spend a lot of time doing at Challenge Success, is educating parents and faculty and kids about what is um, the best practice in terms of, of schools. What, what does the research say um, about how you choose what should be in your curriculum, how you choose how to do assessment, everything in the space category we educate folks about. But we also, because we are educating to parents directly, um, talk about things like how to build uh, a, a healthy home environment. What does it mean to um, have kids um, doing chores and getting the sleep they need? And I'm gonna share with you a little time wheel. And we have this on our website, we have this in our book. This is um, before COVID-19, we would have parents fill this out. We'd have kids fill this out. We'd have basically sometimes teachers fill this out and, and figure out how much time you're spending in each of these categories. And what we would say is, it doesn't look like a very balanced time wheel. Sometimes the kids had way too much homework and way too many extracurriculars, way too much media time before COVID-19, and way too little sleep time and family time, right? And, and, and way too little chores, right? A lot of times it was mom doing the chores or the nanny or the babysitter or whoever doing the chores. This was an elite group uh, uh, at, at the time that I just used that example. Um, and so now, during COVID-19, even more important, we have to see how kids are spending their time and how much is appropriate for them to be online, in classrooms, offline, doing work. Obviously, extracurriculars are sort of, you know, all over the place. We have some extracurriculars that are still going. We have um, acapella online. We have Model United Nations online, right, and the ways that you can make that work. But it's hard to do soccer online. I, I know that folks are meeting with their soccer team and maybe doing drills at home with the ball in front of the TV so they can see their pals. But um, many of our kids are saying they have more time now because they're not commuting, they're not running around and doing a ton of extracurriculars, and teachers are being understanding about a workload. Um, many of our kids have to take on extra jobs to cope with the loss of revenue that many, many of their parents are losing their jobs, so the teams are taking on extra work right now. Um, many families are asking their kids to do chores and it's important to ask your kids to do chores and to um, have them feel like they're helping out and being part of the family. It's actually um, a protective factor. And I'm gonna get into, this is the last, second to last slide, is our mnemonic aid. And just like we looked at best practices around schools and the kinds of things that the research says the school should be focusing on and that's how we came up with the space category we have looked at best practices around child raising and particularly what's called protective factors for kids um, from the Center for Disease Control, from the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Psychological Association. And it turns out they fall into these three categories. You can tell we like these names, right? Space, and now we have PDF. And PDF does not stand for Portable Document Format. It stands for Playtime, Downtime, and Family Time. And it turns out even before COVID-19, kids needed PDF every day, but now in particular, they need PDF. They need time to play. And for little kids, that means building forts and, you know, on your couches. And that's, by the way, engineering, that's science, that's really learning. Um, and for all kids, but particularly for the teenagers, they need to see their friends. And because they can't see them in person, and because they're not going to school every day, and by the way, Friendship is one of the main reasons why kids go to school, especially as they get older. 
um, we need to find ways to incorporate Google Hangouts or Zoom time with kids to be social. And um, that might mean some, some playing games. You know, we, they're talking on their headphones to their friends as they're playing the video games. It might mean helping them schedule some hangout time um, with their buddies. It might mean literally doing homework, not even having a whole lot of talk happening in between, but just having someone on the other side of that screen who you like, who's your buddy, and you're doing homework together. Um, finding time for that play, right? Very social play or, or board games or, or uh, even video games is, is absolutely appropriate right now and is a protective factor. The D stands for downtime. They're gonna need to get sleep. Their sleep schedules, we're hearing from a lot of kids that they're getting more sleep than ever before because of the change in schedule. Um, it's okay to have your teens go to bed a little bit later and sleep in. Just don't let them get so off track that they're waking up at noon or one and they're completely off schedule. And then the most important protective factor is family time. And you, you might be saying, well, you know, that's all we have right now is family time. But what we want is intentional family time where you're checking in with each kid, you're at doing chores together, you're eating meals together. Ideally, it doesn't have to be every meal. Um, technology is turned off during meal time, and um, and kids are getting uh, uh, the important sort of positive um, feedback that they need that we have your back, that that we're doing what we need to do to be safe as a family. So with that, I'm, I've given you some, some research-based frameworks on how we'd like to see schools scheduling things on how we'd like to see parents scheduling things. I'll put up our website here with lots and lots of information for you. Um, we also have um, some nice social media presence, but um, we have a particular COVID-19 resource page where you can find lots and lots of information. You can find video workshops um, and other resources. So with that, I will turn it over to some Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pro, for sharing. Um, now, um, I will have some questions from the audience. So the first question that we are having is, Dr. Po, can you give us an example of authentic assessment at a secondary school level? How long should students spend working on such an assessment? Sure. So um, there's lots and lots of examples I can give. Um, one thing that comes to mind um, before COVID-19 was we would have chemistry students actually take water samples from the school water fountain and they would run chemical analyses on these samples and then they would write a report and it wasn't just the teacher who saw the report or the school they actually sent the report to the city engineers that's an example of authentic assessment they know that it's going to a real audience it's going to be more than just the teacher who sees it it's serving a real purpose it's doing a service to the community it's very authentic to their lives because this is the water that they're drinking and it's extremely academic in that you have to learn the chemistry and you have to learn how to write up an actual scientific report and send it to the engineers so there's a lot of motivation to do things right and they're excited about it that's that's an example thank you for sharing um there's another audience us with the students to feel belong belonging to the school. What are some ways that you can suggest for the teachers to engage like an open conversation to make the students feel belonged or to be feel cared for? That's a great question. We're actually in the middle of a huge um, Spencer research grant where we're interviewing kids to find out what they think teachers should do to help them feel like they're part of the family, like they belong. Um, and so what, what we're hearing from teachers where we ask what they already do to create a climate of care and to have kids feel like they belong. And then we're asking kids, um, there are some basic things, um, know their name, right? Don't mix up their name with someone else. Um, say hello, say goodbye, have a, a, a welcoming approach when they come into the school, when they come into your classroom. Um, know that they have other things going on in their life. You can show an interest in that. Again, you have with a caveat, some kids don't want you to, you know, be all in their business, right? But but to show, to say, hey, you know, how was the basketball game? Or I heard that you guys won the, the football game. Um, tell me about it. it. They really like it when um, teachers sh uh, are, have fair discipline practices where they don't play favorites. Um, and they like it where they can keep control of the classroom, where they feel like a teacher's doing their job and being responsible. Those might be things that teachers aren't thinking about building belonging. 
but they absolutely, they absolutely do. Um, and then also teachers being flexible and understanding when something goes wrong, when kids make mistakes. Um, you want to create a classroom that they're not afraid to be in. You want to create a classroom where they know it's okay to make a mistake, where the teacher sometimes makes mistakes. Um, and you show flexibility, like if they have five tests next week, you're going to move your test. All of those are examples on ways to uh, build belonging and a climate of care. Thank you. Those are really great examples to show like the love from both sides. Another question that we have is, um, Dr. Pope, how to not just let the children learn the skills and the knowledge, but also learn how to deliver truly transform transformational experience, how to make sure evaluation is not biased, and how to drive self-directed learning motivation. Yeah, this is hard. And I, you know, a lot of schools said to us, and we work with, with um, sort of a wide range of schools, they said, well, if we change to pass no credit, we're worried that the kids aren't going to do anything, that they won't be motivated. Um, and, you know, one of the main things that we teach in our workshops is how to get kids engaged and excited about learning. And again, I know this is going on in Avenues. My guess is it's going on at Dave's school and at Cindy's school as well, um, where you give them voice and choice over what it is they're doing, where they see the relevance, where you show them that the real world skills that are coming out of this, where it's not just you need to know this for the test or you need to know this for next year or you need to know this for college. Um, it's also really important to uh, think about what, um, what are the most important things that you're teaching in your subject area. So you're, you're not, you know, you're not going to make it through the whole history book. History gets longer every day. I mean, someone's going to be writing about this time period at some point, right? So what are the main concepts that you want to convey? What are the main skills really lifelong transferable skills, 21st century skills, right, that, that you're trying to convey where content is just a medium for doing so. And I think as, as teachers think that through, what can I cut, what, 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 what isn't so critical um, because I'm focusing on skills and I want the students to be engaged in learning those skills and showing that they have um, mastered those skills over time. Thank you. Um, we have also a um, few more questions. The next question is, um, Dr. Pope, could you please share some challenges regarding to the um, scaling up process of those type of programs? Thank you. Yeah, so that's one of the things that we spent a lot of time working on at Challenge Success. Um, I am a product of a Stanford School of Education as well. That's where I studied, even though that's where I'm also teaching. And um, I studied under Larry Cuban and David Tyak, who wrote a book called Tinkering Toward Utopia. And their view is you're going to have to make these changes probably one school at a time, one system at a time. It's very hard to kind of top down uh, enforce the kind of changes that I'm talking about in terms of engaging learning, problem-based learning, authentic assessment, climate of care. And, um, and, and, and if you're an individual teacher, you can start with your own classroom. You can start with one unit and practice this and take some baby steps. Um, and then maybe get a partner in your department. Sometimes we have departments take on a challenge to um, figure out, are they going to really be using the space framework and how is that going to work as an English department or a math department? How can they get on the same page in terms of rubrics? How can they get on the same page in terms of the big skills that they want to see the kids learn by department level? And then as you get a little bit more buy-in, and buy-in is a key thing when it comes to transformational change at schools, you can get a school-wide learning profile, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can say, here's what we want our graduates to know. Here's the big picture. How do all the departments line up with that? How do all the individual units that teachers are teaching line up with that? So we use very much a school-by-school -school model. Uh, one size does not fit all. Um, mm -hmm. The schools that you're going to hear from are all different, but they're working in, in, in ways to get buy-in from the community, to get buy-in from the faculty, to have a, an overall vision um, but to allow the stakeholders to have a say in that. When, when we make changes at schools, we have teams come who are principals, teachers, parents, and students on the team in order to really think through the change. And, and the students are the ones that are living through it. So if they're not part of that change process, you're going to get a lunch line that's way too long to get through in the time that you've planned lunch. So, so it's really important to get all the stakeholders on board and get that buy-in in order to make those changes. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have, we just gonna uh, finish with the two more questions, then we're gonna move to the um, panelist discussion section. Um, so the question is, during COVID-19, students are spending the whole day in front of the screen. Dr. Pope, do you think it is necessary to follow the school schedule to run their virtual school? I, I don't know what the others on the panel are doing, so don't get mad at me here, but I would say no, and here's why. It is too long of a day for most kids the way that most teachers are teaching to be on Zoom from 8 to 3 p.m. Now that said, there are many schools that are doing a lovely job of turning the screens off, of doing asynchronous learning and then come on back online. I do think it's really important. We, we also have schools where, where teachers aren't checking in at all, where it's just um, worksheets being given out or, or paperwork being given out because um, they can't get everybody online and in the name of equity, they've been having to do that. So what I prefer is a little bit of online where the teacher can do some um, um, you know, nice uh, teaching where you're doing interactivity with Zoom, you're going into breakout rooms, you're asking kids to do all sorts of um, different projects. Maybe they're all holding up the paper with their work. Maybe you're having a discussion. Maybe you're planning simulations and debates. There's a lot of things that you can do online that's very interactive. What we don't wanna see is just straight lectures. And what we don't wanna see is lecture, test, lecture, test, lecture, test. I also wanna put a caveat out that there are some kids who are getting, they're just drowning in work right now. Um, and teachers are trying to cover everything that they meant to cover between now and June. And that cannot happen. There's too much going on in the world, in their lives. Uh, it's too hard to be on Zoom and do it all, so less is more. Thank you. Um, and the last question we have is, in what ways can education technology help parents better manage their kids' studying time at home? Well, um, if the school is sending home too much, or some parents say too little, um, over communicating with the school would be my best advice. And so using that technology would be in whatever way you communicate with the school, whether it's email, whether that's phone, um, you know, to, to let the school know. If you're a parent at home and you wanna manage technology use, I want you to remember that not all technology is created equal. So when they're online chatting with their friends or um, FaceTiming with grandma, those are really important to, things to be doing right now during COVID-19. Um, you don't want them just watching, you know, YouTube videos on repeat all day long, right? You don't want them binge watching like all of Game of Thrones, but, but um, a little bit of media and downtime and fun time, absolutely appropriate. Um, uh, time where they're have, spending time with friends, even if one person's got their Monopoly board on their side and the other person has their Monopoly board on the other side, I count that as, as okay. And of course, we want to have some non-media time. Uh, no media at the dinner table or the lunch table or the breakfast table. Uh, you want to exercise. You want to get outside. You want to get some fresh air when you can um, or just even sit on a balcony, right, if, you, if you're not allowed to go out in certain countries. Um, but some non-screen time is really, really important as well. Obviously, doing chores, non-screen time. So you'll have periods of the day where they're on screen. You'll have periods where they're off screen. Uh, please monitor the content. Make sure it's not overly violent. Um, make sure it's appropriate. And for all kids, young kids especially, but for all kids and even adults, you want to be off screens at least an hour before bedtime because that's going to impact your sleep cycle. It's going to impact what you dream about. Um, it's going to make it harder to fall asleep. Um, and that goes for us too. Yeah, it's very hard. I have to have a lot of self-control and turn off that button and turn off the TV and turn off the phone to allow myself. Maybe that's a time that you read for pleasure with your kids. Uh, as teachers, you can encourage parents to have that time where they're off. Maybe that's where it's bath time or shower time or whatever it is, family time, but you want them off screens about an hour before bedtime. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing.